jobs and equal rights for all. And I'm also a clean energy researcher. So first of all, talking about the causes, one of the ways that the way has been paved for this pandemic is the use of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have massively contributed to COVID-19's mortality rate because of air pollution. Air pollution due to fossil fuels now kills 7 million people annually. But the people it doesn't kill, it weakens their lungs. It weakens them with COPD, with asthma, with many of the so-called comorbidities that the virus has been exploiting. And the experience of New York City shows that people with these pre-existing conditions, and 55% of the adult population of the United States have one of these pre-existing conditions. These people have 40 times the mortality rate as the people who don't have any of these uh, preconditions, 40 times the COVID-19 uh, mortality rate. The other way fossil fuels have paved the way for this pandemic is that they are a key part of the diversion of trillions of dollars out of essential services, including health services, into profits. And this has led, left the health services of most of the countries of the world incapable of suppressing this pandemic. Now, fossil fuels, as everyone knows, <coughs> is of course central to world capitalism and has been for the past 50 years. In fact, fossil fuels for the past 50 years have dominated world profits. So this graph shows in trillions of dollars the total cost of petroleum, which is the blue curve, compared with total capitalist profits for the entire world. As you can see, most years, the price of oil is already more than total profits. And over the whole period, uh, fossil fuel energy has been the source of the vast majority of capitalist profits. So you might say that this is the, uh, oil is the black bloodstream of capitalism. Of course, it's distributed through the financial system to all other sorts of sectors. But this is the central blood that keeps the system running and has since the 1970s. And we saw how this works in the collapse of March 8th. So people may think that the crash in the stock market values was caused by the coronavirus, and that's not actually what happened. Actually, up to March 8th, the declines in the um, stock market had been quite mild. But it was only after the conflict between Saudi's MBS and Putin that oil prices collapsed. Oil prices went down by approximately 50% in the 10 days after March 8th. And at that point, the stock market collapsed, uh, declining by approximately 30%. But the damage to the financial system just started then. So the oil price crash wiped out a flow of 1.5 trillion in annual profits to world capital. The stock crash eliminated in the United States alone 18 trillion in assets. But what started to really worry uh, the financial sector is that the bond prices tanked even worse. So there was a decline in bond prices of nearly 50% and bonds became unsaleable. Corporations could not borrow at any price. So what happened was corporations in the United States had been borrowing money at about a quarter trillion per year on net, rolling over credit. But now, suddenly, in a matter of days, they had turned from borrowing money 
to repaying money previously borrowed at 1.2 trillion per year, a shift again of one and a half trillion. So the reason why the bonds were falling apart was people did not think that corporations could pay them these bonds with this enormous flow of profits removed. So by March 18th of this year, two months ago, the financial system had gone bankrupt. Profits were down, repayments were way up. Everyone understood who was watching the situation. There was no way that these debts that had been run up over the past decade could be repaid. So there was a massive danger of default and the bank's $3 trillion in corporate loans. If any substantial fraction of that had to be written off, it would wipe out the bank's $2 trillion in equity, forcing a complete government takeover of the financial system because all the banks would have been bankrupt. So that was the situation on close of business Friday, March 18th. Well, you can bet that this government that we actually have was not going to take over the banks. So the Fed stepped to the rescue, not of the economy, but of their economy. So on Monday, March 23rd, the Fed promised to buy unlimited amounts of corporate bonds, no matter what their quality, whether they were worth anything or worthless. And starting with um, three quarters of a trillion in uh, immediately. They started immediately on Monday buying a quarter trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities. These are real estate bonds. And the Fed lent the Treasury a half a trillion dollar for the CARES program, which included one half trillion in loans and even outright grants to large corporations. And that was passed within two days of March 23rd. So the total was again this one and a half trillion dollars, a complete replacement with tax money of the lost oil income. So after the Fed rescue, stocks and bonds do a sudden turnaround. Bonds completely recover within days, and the stocks have recovered most of their losses over the last two months. Oil does not recover. So this is not a direct bailout of the oil sector. It's a bailout of the financial sector, which has been deprived of the oil income. And when we say bailout of the financial sector, who are we really talking about? Who got the money, the one and a half trillion in tax dollars? Who was bailed out? Well, the majority of ownership of the top 500 US companies who had these worthless bonds are 24 financial companies listed there. They own the majority of the US stock market institution. Now, of course, all institutions are ultimately owned by individual capitalists. So if we look at who owns the household shares, 55% of stocks are owned by 1% of the population. And even among that 1%, most of the gains go to the very top of the top. So what we were bailing out here is the billionaires. What we have seen in the past couple of months is a transition from oil finance capitalism, what we've had for 50 years, to state finance capitalism. Not state ownership, but state finance giveaway to replace the oil income. And this is not just the Fed. The European Central Bank is now making three quarters of a trillion dollars in negative interest loans to banks and corporations. Now, a negative interest loan says, we're going to give you this money and we're going to pay you for taking it off our hands. I'd like to get a loan like that from the bank. The Fed could have legally simply waited a few days after March 18th for the inevitable bankruptcy of the banks. And as is its uh, legislatively mandated duty, 
it would have assumed ownership of the financial system. As billionaire Chimath uh, Alahaptia said uh, on a television interview, those are the rules of the game. If you go bankrupt, you're bankrupt. But you can be sure that at the moment they are not playing by the rules. Instead, the state gave the banks and corporations all the capital that needs to stay solvent, but did not take ownership. So obviously we've seen some of this movie before. This is an acceleration of a trend that started with the 08 crash. It is simply false to say that the money that was given out in 08 in the huge TARP bailout has been repaid. In fact, capitalism has not been able to function without a growing permanent subsidy from the state. So this is a curve of the Fed's holdings of these MBS uh, securities. And conspiracy, conspiracy theorists, you know, note that MBS is the same initials as that Saudi guy, very important. So, um, the Fed holding of these worthless bonds increased over the years after 08 to 1.8 trillion. So that's a straight subsidy to the banks. That Fed purchase supplied the overwhelming majority of the bank's present $2 trillion in equity. This is not money that was used for plant and equipment investments, nor for cash reserves to carry you over an emergency like the coronavirus. 14 trillion of the 18 trillion dollars in profits in the last decades have flowed directly to the individual billionaire shareholders in buybacks and dividends. So we have the uh, capitalists being the grasshoppers of Aesop's fable. But who pays? Obviously, we do. Oh, in, the, in budget cuts, wages, benefits, and services cuts. This diagram shows that over the last decades, and especially during the period since the last crash, there has been a transfer of enormous sections of the economy from wages declining to profits rising rapidly. So the state is acting on an increasing basis as a funnel to transfer wealth from the many to the few. What do we do? We must say, take it back. We have to say that this one and a half trillion must be taken back and used for our purposes. How can they take it back? Well, the federal government can take it back very easily by simply selling the bonds that it has acquired. Selling those bonds would create instant bankruptcy of all financial corporations and government ownership of the financial system. This simply would make obvious what has already happened. The government has paid out the money necessary to own the financial system. Who would run such a system? We certainly don't want the present government running it. We have to organize institutions of democratic control to allocate financial resources democratically. And Jay is going to be talking a little bit about how that might happen. The states in the United States can also take back part of this wealth by taxing wealth. A 5% graduated wealth tax would raise $1.8 trillion per year. So the money is there. We have to take it back. What would one and a half trillion dollars per year pay for if we put it into our real economy? A worker's way forward using direct government employment could produce the following gains. Doubling college enrollment, having K through 12 class size, free childcare, tripling housing construction, free healthcare and all these other services, environmental cleaning, creating 28 million jobs directly and indirectly. That's what we could do with this one and a half trillion. Now in the real economy, 
That needs machinery to do things as well as money. A massive public works program requires a great increase in machinery. Where we could get that machinery is from the armaments industry. By producing machinery for construction and industry, instead of aircraft carriers, billion dollar bombers and tanks, we could double the production of machinery in this country almost overnight. So we have to stop arms production and convert to civilian production. But second of all, we'll need a great deal more energy. Now, we have to increase energy without increasing oil, gas, and coal, which are poisoning us. In fact, we need a great deal less oil, gas, and uh, coal. So the key to doing this is energy density. We have to increase energy density. Industrialization was based on the great increase in energy density that fossil fuels had over wood. But now fossil fuel density is too low for our present needs. We burn too much of it, 14 billion tons or three cubic miles per year. Solar and wind also have too low density, making them far too expensive. Providing all the energy needs that we have would cover 20% of the world land with solar and wind. So what we need is a denser source of energy over the next decade. And what we have to do, the only source of energy we can turn to is fusion energy. This is what I do. So you can consider me either an expert or biased, but what we need is fusion energy. Fusion energy powers the sun and the stars. It's the densest form of energy known at the present time. So one kilogram of fusion fuel has the same energy as 700 tons of oil, 700,000 times as much energy density. Hydrogen boron, which is the best form of fusion fuel, is easily available on Earth and produces no radioactive waste. With fusion, we could have energy 10 times cheaper than any available now. And this is our own, our project's own uh, conception of a five megawatt generator, which could power 4,000 uh, households. Very compact and very cheap for half a million dollars. Why don't we have fusion now? People who have been following this may know that it's We've been looking for it for a long time, but the problem is there was never a crash program. The fusion program was always underfunded, and instead of looking at all the possibilities, they concentrated on the single most expensive device, the tokamak. So if you look here, you can see fusion was funded at a small fraction of the Manhattan Project, and an evil smaller fraction of the Apollo project. And right now, most of that money is going to this ginormous machine as the only device that they're putting money into. What we need instead is an all out crash program for fusion that funds all possible routes. That's needed as part of our workers' way forward. And with such a crash program, we could have fusion on the grid within this decade. So to summarize, fossil fuels have contributed to the pandemic. The collapse of oil prices bankrupted the financial system, but the Fed has stepped in with tax money, state money to purchase bonds, protect the financial companies and funnel trillions from us to billionaires. We say, take it back, junk the bonds, tax the rich, socialize finance with democratic control, and thereby finance the workers' way forward, massive public works and service program, including massive expansion of the health system to prevent pandemics from happening, converting the arms production and a crash program for fusion energy. 
So thanks very much for your attention and uh, 